this morning's next speaker is Keith Page from Radio Communications Management in Portland, Maine. <clears throat> Keith has worked in the radio communications and IT field for over 20 years. He holds both a general radio telephone li operator's license and an extra class amateur radio operator's license. His career in public safety includes positions as a fire deputy chief, an EMS service chief, a dispatcher, and he's presently a part-time police officer. His upcoming challenge is to manage a 40-plus site trunked P-25 build-out for the state of Maine. This morning, Keith will be sharing information with us on a system that RCM sold and installed at Sagadahog? Sagadahog. Sagadahog. <laughs> that was close. Sagadahog <laughs> County, which used Master 3 base stations. Let's welcome Keith this morning. Uh, again, one thing that um, Ed didn't mention is that besides all of the experience that I have in a two-way and public safety and whatnot, I also worked in the broadcast industry for many years, both as a, a technician, assistant uh, broadcast engineer, as well as uh, on the air. So I'm very used to being behind the microphone, speaking to up to thousands of people at any given moment, but having lots of sets of eyeballs staring back at me is a little unnerving. So <laughs> we'll try to get through it, okay? Uh, my contact information, we'll get back to that. A little bit about the company. Radio Communications Management was founded in 1983. Uh, we provide two-way radio sales and service for Southern Maine. Um, we do a lot of public safety. Uh, Cumberland County is uh, the most populous county in the state. We handle all their stuff as well as a lot of um, other fire and uh, police agencies. Um, we primarily deal with uh, Kenwood products as well as Harris, Etron, and Rad Data Communications. And we also do factory repairs. Uh, Sagadahawk County, the county we're going to be talking about today, is located in the southern portion of the Maine. Uh, southern portion of Maine is a small little dot right here. It is, uh, by land size, the smallest county in the state. Um, the communications center um, deals with a variety of um, different towns. Uh, they have um, a communications director, three supervisors, and 12 full-time public safety dispatchers. So, when they came to us and said, we want to fix our system, we said, okay, well, what's wrong with the system that you have? And they said, well, you know, we have a site in the northern part, and uh, they have frequencies for their law side and, and their fire side. And then they also had this courthouse site frequency, which is um, more or less in the middle part of the county. And we added at one time uh, another site down here in the southern part because they were having some issues. And I'll show you on a map here shortly that this section of the county, there is actually these little fingers that um, extend down into the Atlantic Ocean. There's a lot of cliffs and it's extremely difficult to cover. We also found that the fire departments down there are extremely picky about um, getting pages for some strange reason, I'm not quite sure why. And uh, because a lot of their volunteer firefighters live uh, along the, um, the coast, they weren't reliably getting pages. So. This particular site and this site were both on the same frequency, both transmit frequencies, and their space far enough apart it wasn't an issue. Or, I'm sorry, this is different than this. However, because of licensing, this site down here had to be the same as a courthouse frequency. So when they did paging, they would have to page out of here, and then once this transmitter went dead, then they'd page out of here. And that became a major issue, and I'll explain why. This other uh, site here, Sky High, is a receive-only voter site. So again, uh, some of the issues, we had, two different, we had two separate sites with different transmit frequencies, and then we added the one site in the southern part of the county to uh, fill in some poor coverage. Um, law enforcement was a little ticked off about the fact that depending on where they were in the county, they had to switch frequencies on their radio. I mean, asking a police officer to change frequencies on a radio is very difficult. Trust me, I know. And then the volunteer fire personnel, they would have to change channels on their pagers. So again, that was a, a huge thing for them. Uh, depending on where they were in the coverage area. A lot of these people would live in the southern part of the county, but they worked at Bath Iron Works, which is one of the largest employers in the state. It's located in the central part of the county in the county seat of Bath. So that became cumbersome for them as well. So again, as you can see, we had one of our transmitter sites up here. Uh, Bath, which is the county seat, was where the courthouse sits. And as you can see, these fingers down here in Phippsburg and Georgetown, this was a real problem down here. So what was the solution? Simulcast. And of course, for the county of Sagadahawk, they don't have a whole lot of money, but fortunately we're able to secure some grant money 
uh, in a little over $100,000, and they came to us and said, well, what can we get for that? So we said, well, you have a lot of pre-existing equipment that we should be able to integrate within the simulcast system. And we use um, a lot of 4.9 microwave in the southern part of the state. Uh, the company that we've chose to go with as a vendor for our microwave stuff is a company called Rad Data Communications. Their stuff is very good. We've had excellent luck with them. It's extremely easy to put on the air, extremely easy to configure, and it's been extremely reliable, and it's extremely, a lot of extremelys, it's extremely uh, cost effective. So we said, well, if we can use it, let's reuse it. So this is the, uh, the Airmux 200, the stuff that they had, again, 4.9. It'll do up to 18 megabits per second full duplex. A transmission range up to 50 miles if you're using dishes on both ends. Again, easy to install, very cost effective, and high reliability. Unfortunately, RAD discontinued the Airmux 200 product. And they've gone to this um, uh, other product called an Airmux 400 Lite, which has quite a few advantages over the 200. Again, you still get the same uh, ease of uh, putting this thing on the air. Uh, it's very reliable, but you've increased now your speed to 50 megabits per second full duplex and transmission range up to 75 miles plus. Um, the way the, the antennas work for this thing, you get uh, true MIMO uh, operation, which is great. Uh, also, we were using, in order to get um, audio back and forth over the microwave link, we were using a product from RAD called an IP MUX. The IP MUX, uh, the one that we have anyway, uh, is an Ethernet solution. It allows for four channels of uh, up to four wire, uh, four channels of four wire analog audio. It supports ENM signaling. It's, again, very easy to configure, very cost effective, and high reliability. Um, we also had two existing voters, one for the law side and one for the uh, fire side. Again, the Raytheon product, which uh, seems like everybody's using, works great. So the plan was, um, there was a, a site in West Bath that we found that would be better than the courthouse site. So the folks at Saginaw said, well, let's see if we can't move over to this West Bath site. So we said, okay, fine. We did some studies there and we found that the site was gonna be great. Um, we were able to get the necessary permitting and such. So um, we had to build that into our system. So we consolidated this new West Bath site with that fill-in site down in the southern part of the county called Phippsburg and we're gonna make that simulcast. Now again, because of the money that they had, we were only able to do a two-site simulcast system for them now, with the understanding that we would integrate the more northern Richmond site at a later date. So we had to, we had to do that. Um, so what do you do first? Because we had very little, if any, experience with simulcast up to this point. So our first point of contact was uh, to, give, to get Ed on the phone and discuss the uh, different design and equipment solutions that we would need in order to make this fly. And um, Ed was great, was able to give us a, a variety of different solutions to choose from, a variety of price points. And then based on a system that we assisted with in Cumberland County, we decided on the, uh, the Harris Interplex Master 3 Spectrocom solution. Now, of course, it helps that we're a Master 3 dealer, but um, we love the Master 3 station and we use them a lot in public safety. They've been around forever. They're extremely reliable, modular in design, and um, again, most of our public safety customers love them. Even though they're expensive, they'd rather pay the extra money to make sure they work. Now the first big question that we had was, will a TDM-based microwave system work with simulcast? And we asked a variety of industry professionals that question, because we didn't know. And we got a lot of different answers. Uh, most of them said, well, you have to have a microwave system that has full RF you know, on carrier all the time. You can't use TDM. But in the end, we, we decided that as long as the latency was a known or a fixed um, entity, whatever it was, that we should be okay and decided to give it a test. So we went with that and everything worked out great. Uh, let's see. So the two existing sites that we have out of Richmond and Bath The RAD is TDM, so it's not transmitting all the time. It transmits in time slots. So they wanted to make sure that since there was a gap in the RF being on the air at any given moment, will that impede something to do in the simulcast? So each channel. Yep. A lot of us think of TDM as 
time division multiplexing like a T1. Right. As opposed to time division duplexing, which is what the rad is doing, is transmitting. That's correct. Yeah. Basically, what ends up happening in this case is that you're on same frequency, okay? So both sides of the hop, your, your time is uh, divided in two. So half the time you're transmitting, the other half you're receiving. So it just volleys back and forth on both sides of the hop. Correct. Okay. So again, uh, the coverage that they had from the two existing sites, you can see here we used Raptor to, uh, to figure this out. And you can see this hole down here. This is uh, down in Phippsburg in one of the fingers. And uh, this was, for whatever reason, a lot of the firefighters like to live right next to the ocean down in these cliffs. So, uh, I don't know, we tried to get them to move, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> when we added the Phippsburg site, this is, uh, we were able to increase coverage down in here. We still had a couple of areas that were iffy, but it worked. So when we did the coverage study for the simulcast, we put all of the, uh, the variables in here and we figured out that uh, we move the site from the courthouse to West Bath, we integrate this Phippsburg cell site, and we leave this Richmond as a multicast for now, and this is the coverage that we're going to get. And as you can see, most of the holes are filled in with the exception of just a couple of different places down here. And after the system was put on the air, we found out that this wasn't an issue. When we ran this coverage study, we used the absolute worst case scenario. So as it turns out, again, this is very feasible down here. Um, like I said, we use the Harris Raptor software. One of the things that the county wanted to do prior to putting any of the stuff in is they wanted to do a lot of drive testing. The, the fire chiefs down here uh, were extremely adamant to make sure that um, this stuff was going to work. So just using analog radios, they went down here and uh, tested right along the water and the fire chiefs were happy and life was good. We continued on. So we had uh, four weeks uh, prior to installation to start building this stuff. And um, as it was mentioned here many times, staging was very important. It's a very good thing that we did that, and we actually built that into our time before we installed it. Um, as soon as the stuff came in, we racked it up, we cabled it up, and we did the initial testing. It took about a week. Uh, and then we tested it in the shop for a week after the build. And while the build was very straightforward, there were a couple of issues. The first, <clears throat> and Harris Broadcast was really good in resolving this issue, and they classified it as the perfect storm of things that could have potentially gone wrong. We had an interplex system that, for whatever reason, would not pass any audio. Um, I got this thing set up, we got E&M going, but for whatever reason, no audio whatsoever. And everything was set up beautifully. We contacted Harris Broadcast and they said, hmm, let's take a look at the firmware versions that you have inside the, uh, the SIM cards for the interplex system. And once we read them, the firmware versions, they said, oh boy, you had one of maybe a dozen cards that have conflicting firmware versions in it. Which, are not, which isn't allowing the, uh, the audio to pass. So we actually had to send the cards back into Harris. They um, put some new firmware, firmware in. We got it back within 48 hours, got this thing up and running, and it worked flawlessly. So that was the only speed bump that we had uh, with the Interplex system. And then um, we just had to make sure that the timing uh, was exact to minimize phase issues, and that was extremely straightforward and very easy to do. Again, um, some special considerations with using the Master 3 station is that we had to make absolutely sure that we did a complete alignment uh, to make sure that everything was operating within uh, factory specs. Now, if anybody has ever used a Master 3, when they were introduced, the first, or the first incarnation rather of software that was used to program these things was called MS Edit. Well, MS Edit is a very cumbersome piece of software. It basically allows you to do anything that that station can do. You can touch it with MS Edit. And it was very daunting when it came out, and a lot of radio dealers and technicians said, listen, this is way too much. It's too complicated. So Harris came out with their current personality programming software, which is great. It, it works fine for 95% of whatever you need to program a Master 3 to do. However, because we're doing something a little special here, we had to use both the current personality programming software and MS Edit. Now the caveat is, if you program a Master 3 station with Personality Manager, and then you go back in and make changes with MS Edit, if you then go back in and make further changes with the uh, dumbed down software, it blows everything out that you did with MS Edit. So you have to be very careful that you track your changes, okay? And the only reason, this is the best part, the only reason we had to use MS Edit in this case was to enable this one parameter called external low speed data. Basically, we were using the, um, 
uh, CTCSS filters, as was alluded to before, and have been used in other systems. And so that PL input into the master three had to come in on a, on a separate pin, and that had to be enabled in the software. So we programmed up the stations with the normal programming software, and then we loaded up MS Edit to enable that one thing, and that was it. The other thing that we had to pay particular attention to was transmit audio. As was alluded to before, and was told to us uh, by the folks that installed the Cumberland County stuff, is that we had to make sure that at whatever the stations were being deviated at, that there was no more difference than 0.2 decibels between all of the transmitters. Otherwise, there were going to be problems. So um, we had to pay particular attention to that. And we made sure that the RX level coming into the system at the voter was negative 10 dB. So again, we did the alignment to the Master 3 station using a uh, module test set that we got from Harris, which is not exactly cheap. But if you're going to be doing uh, alignments to these stations, it's definitely something you want to have. It's a little piece of equipment right here. Again, after the personality is programmed with the normal software, you have to use MS Set It to allow the external CTCSS to come in from the C uh, CTCSS filter unit. And then we had to use a uh, align level meter uh, connected to a separate receiver when we were doing the test that measured uh, up to a 10th dB resolution to make sure that all the stations were 0.2 dB of each other at full system deviation. And then any fine tuning, um, we use a third piece of software uh, for the Master 3 called Master Utility, which is real time adjustment of any of the uh, software uh, potimeter settings in the station to do any fine level adjustments. So, <clears throat> Again, um, we, we worked on this, or I worked on this, really, for a couple of weeks inside the shop. And because of my responsibilities for the state of Maine build-out, the day that we had to install this thing, I wasn't available. I was on the road. So I had to pass off uh, some information to some of the other technicians in the shop and said, go put it in. If you have any questions, call me. Now, they started at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my phone hadn't rung at all. So I was a little nervous. I kept checking my phone to make sure I had service. Um, finally, I gave them a call and said, what's going on? And they said, look, this thing went in slicker than anything. It took approximately three hours, and most of that time was just reconfiguring existing equipment to match up with the simulcast equipment. Um, we had no downtime. Fortunately, the technicians that installed it were able to uh, maintain uh, by using backup radios and so forth uh, so that the existing system was on the air until they were able to flip the switch for the simulcast. And then we brought in uh, the receive-only sites, uh, continued to use the, uh, the IP MUX equipment to bring the audio into the voter because obviously the voting sites were now using the uh, Harris Interplex stuff. Now, once the simulcast system was on the air and they flipped the switch, absolutely no further adjustment was necessary. After it left our shop, we put it in, we threw the switch, and it worked flawlessly right out of the gate. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying we did do a lot of, um, I did use Raptor, and um, we took a look at overlap maps, and we found that there really wasn't anything significant. So we didn't have to make any adjustments in transmit power or antenna patterns or anything like that. We just threw it on, and sure enough, it worked flawlessly. So we were very lucky in that, that respect. The other thing is, just before I came out here to Las Vegas, we, we had um, one of our customers um, who had a simulcast system put in by another shop come to us and order 900 radios. And um, they, they talked to my boss and they said, listen, uh, is there any chance that when these radios come in that you can bench test all 900 of them? And we said, sure, we'd be happy to take your money, but if you don't mind, can we ask why we have to bench test all 900 radios? And they said, well, in order for it to work on our simulcast system, we have to make sure that every single subscriber unit is within factory spec. And we said, well, that's really interesting because we put one in in Sagadahawk County, and then we managed the one at Cumberland County, and we haven't had to touch one subscriber radio. And they said, well, for whatever reason, um, we're going to have to have it done. So we said, well, we'll be happy to do it. The reason being that we suspect is because the simulcast system that they have, the infrastructure may not have been set up properly. Like I said, we have found with this particular system, the one in Cumberland County and other ones that, that we've had uh, the privilege to look at since, everything works perfectly. If you do the infrastructure properly, none of the subscriber units have to be touched at all. So. 
When we were done, this is what we ended up with. The actual simulcast is here at this West Bath site. This is the main site and Phippsburg. So these two sites are in simulcast. Um, this Richmond site is still in multicast, but just before I came out here to Vegas, we were told and we actually got the um, money from Sagadahawk County to go ahead and order the third site. So as soon as I get back, we're going to start making preparations to put that one in. Uh, this courthouse site reverted to receive only as well as this uh, sky high site out here in the western part of the county. Here are some site photos. Um, this is at the West Bath site. You can see in here these are the, uh, the IP muxes from RAD uh, handling the audio coming in from the sky high as well as the courthouse site. These are the air mux units. These indoor units are what control the uh, actual um, radios up on the tower for the microwave. You can see the interplex system here, as well as the uh, Spectrocom equipment, the JPS voters, and then the Master 3s themselves. We're using a TXRX duplexers. Now, a little bit closer up, and you can see these are uh, the dishes for the RAD equipment here. They're two foot dishes, 27.5 uh, dB or so of gain. It's really good stuff. And at Phippsburg, not as nice. Uh, we have just a little bit of a, a shelter that was added in at the cell site, but again, you can see the interplex um, uh, stuff here, the um, air mux, and the Master 3 equipment, and duplexes. And also, it's kind of hard to see, but your CTCSS filters are here as well. And a little better shot of uh, the Phippsburg site. That's basically all I have. And I guess.